welcome to Canonical. I'm James Xiao, and I'm joined by Ia Darris and Sam Spieler. Hey. Hey. Hi. So today we are rounding out our series on transhumanist sci-fi with The Wind-Up Girl by Paolo Bacigalupi. Since this is a review, we won't reveal any spoilers. If you haven't read the book, you can keep on listening. If you want to join our discussion, you can find our book club on Reddit by clicking on the link in the episode description. And if you would like to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link, which is in our episode description as well. At our bookshop store page, you can find the books for our book club and other books that we recommend. And we are also on social media at Canonical Pod. Next week, we will be having an in-depth discussion of this book, and we hope you'll join us for that episode as well. So Sam, this was your pick for our series. Why don't you start us off? Yeah. This is the 2009 debut novel from a prolific American writer who has won a number of awards, uh, especially for this book. The Wind-Up Girl won a host of awards, including the Hugo, Nebula, Locus, and several international awards. The Wind-Up Girl excels in its world-building, plotting, and dialogue, but doesn't skimp on good prose as a trade-off, like a lot of sci-fi. The ideas are interesting and may satisfy some hard science fiction fans, but the decent writing will keep people who need more from their sci-fi. It is not without problems, but it does offer a unique look at a post-apocalyptic world plagued by corporate greed, even in the face of environmental problems created by those same powers. I guess I'll also add that parts of this book, or at least the characters in this book, were published in their standalone stories and novellas before the publication of his book. And you can kind of see it here because it's told from multiple points of view. And I see it as him trying to use the previous stories that he worked on and kind of trying to fit them in in this novel. So I definitely see that influence. It doesn't feel like a hodgepodge, though. Like, you can see how things could be taken apart, but it does feel like a cohesive whole. Yeah, I think where it feels like a cohesive whole, and we'll get into this in more detail later, is I think he did a lot of work to make the plot work with all these characters. But I didn't think he did that with theme. Yeah, let's talk about plot. This book takes place in 23rd century Thailand, I believe, in a world where fossil fuels have all but gone and energy is mostly limited to energy stored in things like kink springs, calories, and genetically modified beasts of burden. The point of view rotates between a large cast of characters. There's Anderson Lake, the undercover foreign devil calorie man, Jai D, the prideful white shirt captain. Emiko, the titular wind-up girl, a genetically modified Japanese illegal new person left by her previous owner to live in secrecy as a sex worker. And Hak Sung, an ethnic Chinese man who has used his calculating nature to survive the ethnic cleansing in his Malaysian homeland, now trying to make a new life in Thailand. There's a lot of intrigue, both political and personal. It's post-humanist in how it ponders genetically modified or created new people and their place in our world, while also exploring the question of how they and similarly created creatures, such as Cheshires and Megadonts, might be suited for the mess of a world humans have created. Uh, Calorie Man, Sam, you mentioned Calorie Man. To explain, a Calorie Man is someone who works for a GMO company, right? Correct. That's a calorie man. Yeah, there's a lot of terms he throws around in here. Um, This is in the future when GMO companies have destroyed a lot of things. And so calorie man is the term people use as a denigration of those people since they have ruined the world. One thing I found curious, I want to ask before we move on, In this novel, there is genetic engineering and international travel, 
but they're still using giant kind of elephant creatures to do work. Does that seem like a cohesive world to you? Like it seemed odd to me. It makes sense to me. Why doesn't it make sense to you? What's not cohesive about it? The fact that they can genetically modify creatures and build cloned human beings, but still are using giant elephants to do work. But I think they're modified elephants. Yeah, it's a modified elephant, but it's still an elephant. It's still a beast of burden. Well, they still have electricity, but they don't have fossil fuels to create that electricity to run their machines. So they need physical uh, kinetic energy created by something. That's why they have the kink springs. That's why they have treadle computers rather than actual regular computers. One of the most interesting parts of the book for me is the economy that's set up here where you have to convert calories to joules. That's what the economy is based on. Like you have to grow food, things eat that food, and then you have to use manual labor, either with beasts of burden or a person pedaling a bike, and then convert that into stored energy. Yeah. I think he's trying to go for something similar to the steampunk aesthetic where you have this deliberate incongruency. Um, I've heard people call this book biopunk. It's part of a biopunk movement. I'm not sure how deeply I cared about biopunk specifically, but I do think that there is a, an incongruity that other people might like more than I do. Uh, my question, yet is what would it be instead? You said it's incongruous, but it can't be something mechanical because of the world he set up. So what would you expect instead, like a different kind of human? Well, I I guess your question comes from the perspective that it has to be this world. And yeah, in this world that he's written, you do have to have some way to convert calories into joules. But I think that you have the incongruity because you have the world. And I'm not willing to preserve the incongruity just for the sake of the world. I guess I disagree in that that's the most interesting part of it for me. I think you can pick one of two paths when you're writing this kind of book. You can make things mechanical or you can make things genetically modified. When I say this kind of book, I guess I mean a sci-fi novel set in the future where people are still on Earth, but there's a scarcity of resources. And in this case, it's a scarcity of energy. Right. So you make one of the two choices. I don't think one is more valid than the other one. I think, you know, we're we're going a little bit off, but the the questions that you're asking seem to be based on the world where energy is scarce and creating and storing energy is a main concern. And I understand why Bacigalupi chose to write the novel to present that certain premise to the reader. But what I'm saying is, is that that premise to me is not so appealing. So I'm not so worried about creating some sort of contrived situation in order to, to satisfy the premise. I'll jump in here and say that I did find it intriguing. I I did enjoy it, but it didn't feel realistic to me. I can see a lot of things happening. Obviously, climate change is a huge issue that we're going to continue facing for as long as we're alive and after. But this, I, I did have to suspend quite a bit of disbelief for this. There's an information gap in any kind of speculative fiction where you don't know enough about the world to know if it's actually coherent. And this novel is no exception. But when I see people doing these advanced technological things, and then I see people using giant elephants to power that, even though it could be possible, it just feels strange. And that feeling is important to me. I don't disregard the feeling, even though, yes, it could possibly be coherent in some way of explaining this world. I thought this world kind of reminded me of 
like a bit of a darker version of Blade Runner, literally, because there's no electricity. And I found some of the terms and ideas kind of neat, like whisper sheets, which are, I guess they're newspapers or something similar. Um, Megadonts, Cheshires. And then there were other ideas that I really enjoyed that are not new, but they're used very interestingly, like boiling down energy units to joules and calories. I enjoyed most of the characters. I thought they were multifaceted. They have some issues. One of the things I really liked here that I don't see in a lot of fiction, especially science fiction, is that no one here is a paragon of good. There's, everyone is dirty in some way. I don't think there's anyone in the book that you can point to and say, that's a perfect human with no flaws. I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think that Emiko is presented as a character who has more morals than others, or at least fewer opportunities to do bad things. Uh, other people seem to have more opportunity to manipulate other people or take advantage of other people. I agree. She is kind of given a pass, I think, because of her nature, because she's a new human, a new person. Right. Yeah. She kind of seems childlike in a lot of ways. You know, she's very naive, for example. I thought you were just trying to throw shade at our last book, A Fire Upon the Deep. Uh, Well, that, yeah. I mean, <laughs> I would not call those characters multifaceted. What did you think about the use of language? The random Chinese and Thai and Japanese, maybe? I, yeah. I seem to recall a few phrases of yeah, Japanese. Yeah, there's Gaijin. Mm -hmm. It didn't really add a whole lot. What I didn't like about it is, first of all, from a technical standpoint, it was always in italics, so it never became part of the world or part of the novel's discourse. It was always something super added into the novel rather than integrated into its character. And it was always just kind of this flashy sort of demonstration of cultural awareness or literacy. You know, it was never sincere in terms of engaging with the other the other's perspective but just a way of saying look remember these people say things differently and i know a little bit of their code yeah and that kind of leads to my greater dissatisfaction with the novel um i should say though that i did actually really enjoy the novel i thought it was really engrossing in the long line of sci-fi thrillers this was pretty successful I was totally invested in the characters. I want to know what happened next, etc. But the main critique I have with this novel has to do with the choices that Bacigalupi made when constructing his world. Earlier, yeah, you talked about you know the decision to go with this kind of biopunk aesthetic. For me, the the critique I have about his world construction is if we think about what sci-fi does or how it works. Uh, the world of the novel can't be totally alien because then you'd be overwhelmed with exposition, with people explaining what this term means, what that term means. So you have to have this balance between parts of the world that is familiar and parts of the world that is speculative or alien. And you need to create a tether between this kind of speculative content and the audience with the familiar so you can think about the two novels we read previously, A Fire Upon the Deep keeps very little of contemporary society. A lot of it is speculative. And because of that, you have to explain a lot. And Galapagos is set in modern day, but it's filtered through an opinionated narrator, which gives us this kind of sheen of otherness. But it's largely tethered to our contemporary world. What I didn't like about this book is that the speculative parts of the world are interesting, like the technological advancements and all that. But the tether to this world are characters that are very stereotypical, like they are stereotypical representations of cultures from a white point of view. So you have the opportunistic, sneaky, racist Chinese guy, the deferential spiritual Thai, and lady boys. You have honorable, techie Japanese. You have a Japanese geisha. 
you have a genius American scientist, an ambitious and cunning American businessman. Like these are people you see all the time in popular media and popular culture. So I didn't think that they were especially offensive, except for maybe Hawk Seng, which um, the writer did go out of the way to say he got an Asian friend to approve his character and to answer questions about his character. You know, good good job, I guess. Um, but it's disappointing because it's so lazy to do this. Because once again, when you're talking about what's speculative and what actually tethers the book to our contemporary world, you don't have to tether it to stereotypes. You can create new characters and new histories of people. So sci-fi gives authors the opportunity to critically examine humanity, but Bacigalupi kind of refuses this, and he just relies on tired tropes when portraying humanity. And for me, the only interesting character in the book is the wind-up girl, but she's the B-plot of the novel. Now, once again, I actually did enjoy this book, like the process of reading it and the suspense, but I, I just thought that it was a disappointment how much he relied on these tropes when creating characters. The characters themselves, you know, in terms of how it worked in the novel was fine. It's just this whole premise of creating the characters. That's why I took issue with. That's my rant. Do you think the white American characters are presented in a better light than the Asian characters? No. I don't think the issue is that they are presented in a negative light. I think the issue is that he does not put much thought into creating these characters. He creates characters that are really familiar to everyone. That's the problem. They're like right out of central casting. Like you call up your casting director and say, hey, I need a background character who's like X. And then you get this person. That's exactly what it feels like to me. Do their backstories help at all? I mean, I I guess not. Because that's the whole point. No, because the Chinese character has multiple wives. Like, I mean, that's extremely stereotypical. He's relying on this historical point of view of these people that may or may not exist 300 years in the future or 200 years in the future. He has the freedom to create whatever characters he wants, but he chooses to create characters that are stereotypes. I found Huck Sung interesting partly because he had lost everything. His whole life had been destroyed, and that's partly what made him who he was. So even though, yeah, he's opportunistic, sneaky, racist, uh, part of that is informed by what he has had to live through. But why Chinese at all? Mm, Yeah. Why, Why set it in Thailand? Why not set it in Des Moines? And have everything be the same. What is gained from this experience of setting it in Thailand? But then you don't have the exoticism. That's that's exactly right. <laughs> so he relies on the exoticism that is steeped in our present day culture and stereotypes. Like that's the problem. It's sci-fi. You don't have to do that. Yeah. You know, like you don't have to have that exoticism. You have the expanse the TV show and book where you have, you know, whole, like it's political drama, just like this is, but you have earth, you have the belters, you have Mars with the Martians, and you create all this tension through a creation of a new world. That's what sci-fi does. Or you have Battlestar Galactica, right? You have the Cylons and the humans. You create political drama. Political drama doesn't have to come from present day tensions. I'm really confused by why he decided to do this other than the fact that he studied East Asian studies and he traveled in Thailand and he really liked it. I'm not defending his choices here, but the sci-fi you mentioned are literally worlds different. They they take place off world. They take place in space. Whereas this is trying to draw from real world tensions. But you're right. The problem is that it focuses a little heavily on stereotypes instead of trying to build build something more unique out of those tensions? I think it can be defended in a certain way. Because yes, he doesn't do much with this tether that you're talking about. He uses these kind of racial stereotypes and these very stock characters. And 
I wouldn't even say that there's anything in the novel that feels false in terms of these races in the setting, but it's just a very typical sort of pattern that we see in this novel where you have lots of interesting ideas. You have immigration, GMOs, you have race, globalization. All of these things are there, but none of them are used. They're all just window dressing. He just uses this racial conflict as just another source of tension in the plot. He uses GMOs as just tension. He's not engaging with these ideas. He's just saying, look, I can make these ideas dance and make the plot exciting. But it's not engaged in any sort of authorial way. We never see Bacigalupi's point of view. And I do wonder, I don't know if this is offensive because I'm not Japanese, but I do wonder how a Japanese person might feel about Bacigalupi having one of his characters who's Japanese saying, oh, these genetically modified created humans are more Japanese than us because they obey. Like, (laughs) uh, hmm. makes me think. I don't see the problem. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. But do you find an issue with the other kind of missed opportunities in the novel. Like he has the opportunity to do something new or have a new point of view regarding race and nationality and he squanders it. But what about his opportunity to say something meaningful about globalization or immigration? He doesn't do anything with those either. Do you feel like that's as, as problematic? I think it's different because I'm looking at it as he had an opportunity to create a new world, which is the whole point of speculative fiction, is to create a new world and decide what are the parameters, and he opted not to. That's one of the big reasons why people create and read sci-fi, is the creation of a new world. He chose not to do it. Um, You're talking about the effect of reading a book like this, which is, uh, it didn't make you think because he didn't explore any of the ideas. And I'm, you know, I think we can move on to that as well. I don't think he really did explore any ideas present. I agree with Ed. There's certainly a, a perspective that could have been chosen and there is none. It's we're presented with well, like you said, it's it's plot. We're presented with things that happened, but there's no real point to any of them. Well, here I I want to mention something. Um, because it's actually in the novel, a specific way of dodging uh, this kind of responsibility that I think James is talking about. And it's a pattern of dodging. In the acknowledgement section in my copy, it says, on a separate note, I would like to mention that while this book is set in a future version of Thailand, it should not be construed as a representation of present-day Thailand or the Thai people. So what is he doing here? Like, Is he trying to have it both ways where he's using this Thai setting and the Thai people in the novel as window dressing and then saying, in fact, no, I respect Thai people and I'm not trying to badmouth them at all? Like, how can he have it both ways? Part of this is, of course, my own bias. All three of us have lived abroad uh, in Asia. And I think you and I definitely have encountered people who live in Asia and feel like they know everything about that country, (laughs) even if they're not from that country. You know, they'll tell you everything, you know, about this person and the the Chinese are all like this and the Japanese are all like that. It really feels like that to me. He's traveled and he's studied Asia and he feels he can speak confidently about Asia. So he does. And then later on, he's like, well, I don't really want this to come across badly. So I don't want to speak for people who are not my own, but you did, or you tried to. So I I think in the process of writing, he didn't put much thought into that. Yeah, I agree. My bigger concern, though, is even if you were a racist or even if you were kind of just this egotistical foreigner, you have to commit to it. For a writer creating a work of art, you have to commit to it. And I feel like this is just a huge cop out. It's a cop-out, yeah. He's trying to say, I'm saying it, but I'm not saying it. And you can't have it both ways. I agree. Like, he didn't commit to it, and maybe if he did, 
it would be better. But I, I think the problem is he didn't he wasn't even aware of it. Because I think you can write a different point of view. Yeah. Like, I think that's certainly fine. Like, you can definitely, as a writer, write a different person's point of view. But you, if you're doing that, you have to do it well. And you have to do it fully acknowledging that you're doing it. I, I don't think there's an acknowledgement as a, in the process of writing yeah. that he did this. I think he acknowledged it in the acknowledgments, which is the cop-out. Uh, just to defend him a little bit, because I have been quite harsh, there is nobody in the world who is simultaneously American and Thai and Japanese and Chinese. And yes. because that yeah. person can't exist can this story be told if that person can't exist? And I would say probably not. Um, it is possible, like you're saying, for a person to be more sensitive. But at the same time, I don't want to say that writers should be too, too shy and worry too much about not having the global perspective, which is impossible really to have anyways. Well, I, yes, I agree. I think the counterfactual I'll present you with is my original point, which is he's not writing this to explore Southeast Asian political dilemmas. That's not the point of the novel, right? The novel is about globalization and genetic modification and about immigration. Like, that's what the novel's about. You don't need to set in Thailand to tell that story. You're right. It is very hard to tell a story from multiple points of view with different nationalities of people that are similar to people today. But this is speculative fiction. You don't have to do that. You can do this, set this in Nebraska and still have all those themes. I guess here I would disagree with you. I mean, yeah, your original point stands, but I do think that, well, he doesn't explore any of these things I do think that it's significant, at least in Bachagalupi's mind, that this happens in Thailand. I think he wants to make reference to Thailand's history in the 20th century with all of their coups. They've had more coups than any other nation in the world. Like, I think that he wants to engage with that. He just doesn't know how to do it. So while it doesn't work, I think you can see that he wanted for it to work. Let me pose a question to both of you. Do you think this is a book about Thai identity? No. No. That's the only way I can see it justified. Really, it is. Like, if this is his aspiration to write a book about Thai identity and national pride, I, I can see it. He has to include it, all the things we mentioned because all of it is relevant. Like the Thai-Japanese relations, the uh, ethnic Chinese moving in, like all of that is an important aspect of Thai identity today. But I just don't see that as being part of the book, or at least an intended part of the book. Right. There is, I, I don't want to head into spoiler territory, but there are aspects of the ending that point to that being a possibility. But I, I think you're right. I think it's still not about Thai identity. I will still reiterate, I, I did enjoy this book. <laughs> Despite me talking at length about not liking that aspect of the book, uh, overall, the book is an enjoyable read. I would have read it in one sitting if it wasn't, you know, so long. But yeah, I, I didn't want to put it down. It was really easy to read and very suspenseful, well plotted. The characters were interesting. The problem is that the, the problems you guys have mentioned are so central to everything happening that even though it is really enjoyable to read, you can't really escape those issues because they are pervasive throughout. Well, let's all take a break now. When we come back, we'll end with some final thoughts. We'll be right back.
All right, welcome back. Let's talk about who we would recommend this book to. What do you guys think? I have already recommended it to uh, a handful of people who I know really enjoy science fiction. I don't think you need to be a hardcore science fiction fan to enjoy it. Um, but I don't know that it will offer a super casual science fiction person that much. It's very genre science fiction and it's fine. It's very enjoyable, but I don't think it would please people who have no interest in it in science fiction. Well, I would definitely recommend it to all my Thai, Japanese, and Chinese <laughs> friends. There you go. Uh, actually, I, I agree with you. I think this book is really accessible. Hmm. So I, I'd recommend it to anyone who likes sci-fi. I wouldn't recommend it to anybody concerned with identity or identity politics or representation. Like, for those people with those concerns, it's pretty obviously problematic. There are lots of readers who don't care about those things at all. And for those people, I think on a, a craft level, it's very engaging. It's well written. So I think that a lot of people could enjoy it. But you have to set your politics aside or not have any politics in the first place. So how do you think this book compares to other books we've read, either in the series or um, before the series? I'm struggling to decide whether I like this book or A Fire Upon the Deep more, because this book was much better written than The Fire Upon the Deep, but The Fire Upon the Deep was much more interesting in terms of the quality of ideas. Um, so it's really a battle between craftsmanship and ideas between those two. Yeah, I agree. The craftsmanship here is quite good. I agree. He doesn't skimp on the good prose, but there is a, a sacrifice of better ideas that you get from Vinji. I mean, in comparison to another speculative fiction book, also about pandemics that was published around this time, I like this more than Station Eleven, and I thought Station Eleven got a lot more positive press, but, you know, I thought this book was... Uh, better written in a lot of ways. I don't know that it got more positive press. I think it was more mainstream than this in some ways. And this got a lot of, like it won a lot of science fiction awards, even internationally. But Station Eleven, I, I agree. I think I enjoyed this more than Station Eleven as well. But Station Eleven is more, it's closer to the center as far as readership goes. There's a, a difference in sensibility. This is a very masculine novel. It's a very traditionally sci-fi novel, whereas Station Eleven has a more contemporary, more feminine sensibility, which I think is more appealing to modern readers. It's also one of the first books we've read with very explicit sex scenes. Yeah, so there is some pretty explicit sexual content in this book, and I'm not sure how much... It works for me only because the character that it happens to, it's meant to be a sympathetic character, but it's very male gazy. It's very much told for the gratification of a male reader in my reading, at least. Like it felt creepy a little bit. Like it, it felt like he didn't want to titillate you, but he couldn't help himself. Yeah, in contrast to blindness, the way rape was handled in blindness is totally different. You don't get that feeling from blindness. Yeah. True. Although what's happening in those scenes is very different. One is a rape the way we generally think of it in blindness. And in this book, in The Wind-Up Girl, it's supposed to be a spectacle. It's a spectacle meant to entice the other people in the room, entice and impress. Does that change things at all? I think what would have helped it if it were more like blindness, where there was some 
vivid bodily detail that disgusted you. Like in blindness, there's a lot of talk about how there's shit on the floor and how people are covered in shit because they don't know where they're stepping. Mm -hmm. Like that kind of visceral detail takes you out of the titillation and it makes it much more just fleshy and and disgusting. Yeah. Uh, In this novel, it's still erotic in a sense. It's erotic violence, but it's still erotic. Okay, let's conclude here. Thank you for listening. Did you think we were way off base with our review of this book, especially my take? We'd love for you to let us know on Reddit, and I would love to hear from you. Come shout at me. You can find that link once again below in the episode description. And you can also find us on social media at Canonical Pod. If you would like to support us and your local bookstore, you can use our bookshop.org link, which is also in our episode description. We'll be back next week with an in-depth discussion of this book, The Wind-Up Girl. If you're interested in joining our discussion, go ahead and find a copy of this book. Till next time, happy reading. We'll talk to you soon. 